I don't know if you know this, but the direct market is celebrating its 50th anniversary. That's right, 50 years ago. Uh, basically, the direct market started. Your local comic book shop became a big thing within American culture. Obviously, the 80s and 90s kind of blew it up. It got a little bit too big for its britches, had to have a contraction. And right now, we're in the middle of like a really slow contraction. Unfortunately, that is the case. And some people have begun questioning the viability long term of the direct market. It's something I personally as somebody that covers comic books and loves uh, the direct market, loves local comic book shops, I've had to consider myself, is there a time where they're basically just going to have to treat comic book storytelling like graphic novels, just release them in volumes, no, no longer do the periodic format that everyone's used to, floppy comics as uh, us in the know might call them. There was recently an article within Publishers Weekly that covers comic books and comic book industry every once in a while talking about is it time to give up on comic book shops and there were certainly a lot of people in favor of the local comic book shops and the direct market and what it brings that's very unique to the comic book culture itself and the comic book publishing industry and you know distribution certainly is a problem but there are certainly people that are pro that but there were some detractors in there and I did want to talk about some of the ideas or what they had to say regarding periodic comic books i.e floppies the thing that we cover here basically on a daily basis and have been doing for for six years and I have no plans of stopping uh, myself because i don't think the direct market probably is going anywhere i do think it'll continue to contract but there are some things that the direct market local comic book shops bring to the table that bookstores just can't if i'm being completely honest and we'll talk about that kind of stuff but first this is one of the detractors of the periodic format some industry insiders believe that comic shops should shift toward a general bookstore model eschewing the latest periodical comics in favor of a wide and deep selection of comics and graphic novels that can't be found elsewhere. The Silver Sprocket store in San Francisco, for instance, operates on a completely different paradigm than most other comic shops. It doesn't carry monthly comics at all. Its inventory does include graphic novels from publishers such as Abrams, First, Second, and Pantheon, but Abby Ehrlich, publisher of the small press Silver Sprocket, says, our specialty is stuff that you can't really get on Amazon such as micro press comics and European imports. Because Ehrlich also publishes comics by local creators, their fans are drawn to the store, an approach they call bottom-up retailing. Certainly Silver Sprocket is taking a different approach to local comic book shops and kind of getting away from the periodic model, not even selling brand new comic books, and it probably sounds like they don't even sell back issues, just kind of concentrating on graphic novels that you can't find on Amazon. And let's be honest, if you went to Marvel Comics today and you saw the MSRP on Immortal Thor Volume 1. Guess what it is? $29.99. Are you fucking kidding me, Marvel? You have lost your goddamn minds. $30 for Al Ewing's Immortal Thor Number 1? Do you know how much it would cost you to buy all the issues that make up Immortal Thor Volume 1? $32. A whopping $2 in savings. Well, guess what? There's the first appearance of Tyrannus or whatever that stupid character that Al Ewing introduced in the comic book. That comic book could be worth $7 one day and I will make all my money back. It's just, it's crazy what they've done to trade waiters. But if you go to Amazon and you look up Immortal Thor Volume 1, you know, MSRP $29.99, guess how much they're selling it for? I believe it's $11.99. So well over half the cover price day one from Amazon. And that certainly hurts the prospects of a lot of comic book shops just becoming graphic novel stores where they give up periodicals, they give up back issues, and they concentrate solely on graphic novels. You would have to go out there and curate a very weird line of comic books, you know, from a micro press and obviously going over to Europe and maybe finding some translated manga that hasn't made its way into the big box stores and all that kind of stuff. And in this case, Silver Sprocket also produces comic books from local creators and stuff like that. I don't think a lot of people got into the comic biz to actually become a publisher. I think a lot of people got into the comic biz as far as local comic shops because they really fucking like Spider-Man, because they really like Batman. They really like a lot of the bigger characters and franchises out there, and they wanted to be a part of the industry because they have a lot of love for it. So while I do think a model like what Silver Sprockets are doing is very inventive, it's very cool, it's very niche, it's very San Francisco. Let's put it that way. I don't think that's a one-size-fits-all kind of answer to what comic book shops are experiencing right now with the kind of slow contraction that we're seeing throughout the industry. I think a lot of people 
want to sell Spider-Man. They want to sell Batman. And they like the format of floppy comic books. They like the monthly format to where basically you're getting episodic reading of it. You know, and there are a lot of books out there that if you read them, they read like crap in graphic novel format. Now, there's a story out there that I've only read as a graphic novel. It's called Infinity from Jonathan Hickman. I like Jonathan Hickman. He's one of my favorite writers out there. And it's basically a more modern approach or take on um, the Infinity Gauntlet. And it reads like crap, reads awful in graphic novel format. But as I was reading it, I was like, man, if I was reading this like one issue a week or every two weeks or something like that, because it, I think it was spread out between three different series, it would have been a lot easier to take it all in. But reading it from front to back with all those concepts and a lot of the stuff that was happening because it was so wide in scope, it was almost impossible to actually keep up with everything that was going on. And one of the few stories in modern times that I think absolutely reads better, likely, in periodic format. There are certainly a lot of books being released by Marvel and DC that should be released as graphic novels and not even in periodic. But that's another problem for another day here. But I don't think everybody wants to become their own publisher. There are certainly other comic book shops out there that, you know, they do new comic books, they do back issues, but maybe they focus on retailer exclusive variant covers and stuff like that. There isn't a one size fits all solution here, but I do think just throwing out periodic comic books like the baby with the bathwater is not the right approach to this because there are unique things that periodic comic books bring to the table. Next up, Terry Nantier, founder and publisher of MBM is also doubtful about the future of periodical comics. Look at the pricing going up all the time for such a short read, he says. I just don't think that's sustainable in the long term. And Francie points out, comic shops are bookstores that only sell graphic novels. As long as North American stores come to understand that they are comic bookstores and not comic book stores, they'll be fine, he quips. Well, I don't think that American culture should be seeding their ideas and be like, you know what? That's how they do it in France. That's how we should do everything. I don't think we should be borrowing a lot of ideas from the French other than their cuisine, which is absolutely immaculate and it's very, very good. But, you know, not everybody wants to read things in graphic novel format. Within the American comic book community, the periodic format is the established way to read them. And even in Japan, which has the largest comic book audience in the world, I believe the Japanese comic book market is two times as big as the United States, even though they have a fraction of the amount of uh, citizens as the United States. They release their stuff, for the most part, in periodical format. A lot of times in uh, the Shonen Jump magazine, Tonkabon's type of stuff. Now, certainly everything comes out, as I mentioned, within the graphic novel format that they use, the smaller size than American counterparts. But it's certainly the accepted way to release comic books, even in Japan, which has a much larger established economy and scale and all that stuff than all of Europe basically does when it comes to comic book sales and stuff like that. I don't think that we need to go to France and be like, well, that's how they do it. I would rather be looking at what Japan does because they're so much more successful. And what's interesting about American comic books, and we have something that not even France really has. There is an enormous collector's market that comes along with American comic books. You not only do you have the readers, and you certainly have some speculators that come in, they're like, well, that's the first appearance of a, of a character. Uh, that's something that might be made into a movie that might make it worth more in the long term. I would like to invest money in it now, and perhaps when, an, when a project is announced, I'll go and sell it on eBay or something like that. You get an enormous collector's market that really adds to the bottom line of what you can make on comic books. There are people out there that buy every single issue of Spider-Man, no matter what. There are people out there that buy every single issue and every single cover of X-Men, no matter what, whether they read it or not. They might be going, you know what? I'm not really enjoying Fall of X, but I have a complete run of X-Men, and I will continue to have a complete run of X-Men, you know, including all the covers, which is something that Marvel and DC have taken advantage of. That's why we get so many of the variant covers now, because they're selling the same comic books just to a smaller audience. And we need to take ideas that can expand that audience and not contract it more to where the comic book shops are having to compete with Barnes & Noble or Amazon or Walmart and stuff like that. There are unique things to the American comic book format, the periodical, that really helps it out and gives it an advantage to their counterparts in the bookstore market. The best case example that we have, at least recently, and every time you have an article talking about enthusiasm or excitement or what's going right in comic books in 2023 or 2024. They are going to talk about the Energon universe. And of course, this article did as well. Skybound co-founder Robert Kirkman held a marketing call with a group of about 100 retailers 
a few weeks before the final orders were due for Void Rivals number one. After a dramatic pause, Kirkman said, what I'm about to tell you is top secret. The reveal was Jetfire, a Transformer, would appear on the last page of Void Rivals number one. Following that reveal, Skybound announced three new series set within the same universe, Transformers and two G.I. Joe limited series, Duke and Cobra Commander. Six months later, Transformers has officially taken over from Batman as a top-selling series. That compounding enthusiasm was what keeps the direct market engine running. And that is exactly right. And when they made that announcement, and kudos to the retailers who did not spoil it, although I did know a couple of weeks beforehand, but I didn't spoil it either. They only told me in confidence, a couple of them did. They went out there and they ordered 40,000 more copies of Void Rivals number one because they knew not only was it the beginning of a new comic book, the number one issue always sells better, but now it was associated with Transformers. It was going to be associated with G.I. Joe in the beginning of a new universe, which brought in speculators and collectors, and they were able to be prepared for that enthusiasm. Unfortunately, Marvel Comics did not take the same approach with Ultimate Spider-Man number one. And uh, that kind of sucks. Maybe if they hadn't told everybody that Peter Parker and MJ were going to be married and they didn't do Ultimate Universe and Ultimate Invasion and they just launched out with Ultimate Spider-Man, but they told the retailers they actually would have had the amount of comic books people wanted to buy. In fact, everyone sold out of Ultimate Spider-Man and there were thousands of people that wanted their copies and couldn't get a hold of them because they weren't aware of just how amazing it was going to be. If you do this right, the direct market is absolutely sustainable, but you do need enthusiasm. You do need buy-in, not just from the collectors, not just from the speculators, but you do need buy-in from the readers, and that is really what's lacking right now. If you are reading Marvel Comics in 2024 and certainly at the end of 2023, you will notice almost across the board Average is a godsend these days. There are so many below average comic books that they're releasing, it's not even funny. There are only a handful of series that are consistently even good nowadays. The entire X-Men line is pretty much unreadable right now. Amazing Spider-Man, not very good. A lot of the big time books out there, including even Avengers, which is probably, I guess, the best one out of the three franchises, isn't very good. Like it's pretty average at best. And Marvel Comics, as the market leader in American comic books when it comes to periodic format, have not kept up their end of the bargain. Now, certainly with Ultimate Spider-Man, they have. People showed up and they've had to do a lot of reprintings of all that kind of stuff. And there's enthusiasm for that. But there is no enthusiasm for the 616 because they've hired so many bad writers and they've cut costs everywhere that they can to where there's really not a whole lot of quality there. DC comic fans have a little bit better. There are more good DC series out right now regularly than there are Marvel. It's a much smaller universe. And even the stuff that's not great is kind of average right now. There is some really atrocious stuff, but a lot of times they're more fringe titles. It's not often that you get a Gotham War or I guess even uh, Night Terrors, which was pretty damn big. That was such a bad idea. But if Marvel and DC would clean up their act, learn from Skybound and what they did with the Energon universe, bring in really talented people like a Daniel Warren Johnson, they could actually build some stuff up because you need that enthusiasm. Without the enthusiasm, there probably is no sustainability to the direct market because people don't have a reason to show up every single Wednesday and buy their two or three books that they can't miss, and then they've got enough left over for two or three more books that they want to go and sample. Right now, I think people have one or two books a month that they can't miss, and they can kind of skip the other weeks. And even when they show up for their one or two books, maybe they're in the same week, they go, I don't know that I want to go try out Amazing Spider-Man right now. I heard it was really bad. Unfortunately, that's like the really big detriment to all of this is there isn't a lot of enthusiasm because there's not a lot of quality. We do know the Ultimate Universe is expanding. We've got three series now. We've got the Ultimates coming. We've got an Ultimate Style Universe coming from DC Comics led by Scott Snyder. I imagine initially at least that will be very, very successful. And we still have the Energon universe, although it does appear they are watering that down with the subpar talent. Looking at you, Kelly Thompson. <laughs> so hopefully this stuff is sustainable, but they need more big hits. That's the big thing. I will end this one on a more positive outlook from one of the people that contributed to the article. Whatever the future holds, local comic shops thrive when they deliver what few bookstores can, a third place for fans where they can chat about favorite series, stumble on new ones, and generally geek out. There's gorgeous stuff on the shelves every single week, and your job is to help people find it, says Katie Pride, owner of the comic book shop, Books with Pictures. Your job is to be excited about as many things as possible in your store, which doesn't mean you like everything, but you should like comic books. Yes, I do think if you own a comic book shop or, or work in one, you should probably like at least a few of the modern 
offerings that are out there. You know, I do the best of the week podcast every single Saturday to help people find the very best comic books that they can. I do the hot or not show on the Patreon, which is much more expansive and looking at kind of everything across the board and talking about it. But I want to help people find good comic book shops. I think most local comic book shop owners want to help people find good comic book shops. Now it's on Marvel and DC to offer good comic books or it probably isn't sustainable. It probably ends up collapsing on itself. Unfortunately, I don't want to lose local comic book shops. I, you know, I don't have one in my hometown. It absolutely sucks. I get my geek fix talking to you guys and obviously all the friends of the channel that we have here basically on a weekly basis and, and I'm able to kind of fill that void in my life. But I don't think everybody wants to start a YouTube channel talking about comic books because there's no local comic book shops anymore. That's the place where we could go. We can meet up at Sacred Ground. And we need to do everything that we can to preserve it. Hopefully, Marvel and DC get with the program and start delivering some good stuff because I don't want to go into a comic book shop only expecting graphic novels. I don't want to go into a comic book shop only expecting comic books from Europe. I don't want to go to an LCS and be like, yeah, where's your local press stuff? Where's the stuff featuring characters I've never heard of? I like Batman. I like Nightwing. I like Spider-Man. I like X-Men. I want this stuff to continue on, and I do like the independent stuff. I like creator-owned stuff as well, but not all of it is for me. A lot of that stuff is for very niche audiences, and without the mainstream stuff, there probably is no future, unfortunately. Definitely want to hear from you guys and what you think about local comic book shops. Is there a future despite you know newspapers going away and books becoming less prevalent and people turning more to e-readers and stuff like that? I think there is a place in the future for comic books. I don't know how long that's going to last, but hopefully, you know, throughout my lifetime, that would be long enough for me. If you like more comic book talk about all this kind of stuff and your favorite comic book characters and heroes and all that stuff, and you haven't checked out Thinking Critical Patreon, you are missing out on the best coverage of comic books from the best fans of the entire universe. Doc, Aaron Sparrow, 32 Flavors of Nick Weiser, Jim from Weird Science, yours truly, all available on one great package, over 32 hours of new content every single month. On the Patreon, there's a link in the video description, and there is a free trial right now to where you can even get the highest tier for 20 bucks for free for one week and see if it's for you. Definitely check it out.